Well, good evening, everyone. This evening, we are going to study about the Church of Pergamum. Actually, in the New King James Version, it's called Pergamus. So that will be our study for this evening. And uh, the passage is found in Revelation 2, verses 12 through 17. But before we study, we want to ask the Lord's blessing. So I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we come before your throne this evening with uh, gratefulness in our hearts for giving us a wonderful day filled with your blessings. We ask that as we study this passage this evening that uh, you will bless us, teach us the lessons that will be useful in our personal walk with Jesus. We ask that your word will not return unto you void. And we thank you for hearing and answering us, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. First of all, we're going to read the passage once again, Revelation 2, verses 12 through 17. And I'm going to emphasize certain phrases and words in this passage. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus, you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. So that is the passage that we're going to take a look at. It's a little longer than the first two. And of course, in our study tomorrow, we will deal with Thyatira. That is the longest message in uh, Revelation 2 and 3. First of all, let's take a look at the city of Pergamum. It helps us to understand uh, the geographical area in which the church was found. The city of Pergamum was on a lofty and ragged hill. The rock stood about 1,000 feet above the fertile valley floor. The walls of the elevation were almost perpendicular, except on one side, where there was a steep and narrow passageway that led to the top. It could easily be fortified because they only had to fortify that one place. The inhabitants of the city considered it an invincible stronghold. The city could only fall through treachery, trickery, or stratagem, like happened with ancient Troy. The name Pergamum fits very well with the characteristics of the city. Pergamum means height or elevation. The name also has a possible connection with the Greek word gamos, which means marriage. During this period, the church married the state, and Satan was able to ruin the church from within. What he failed to do through persecution in the church of Smyrna, he did by infiltrating the church from within. Pergamum was a great educational center in Asia Minor, actually Western Asia. Both Homer and Herodotus studied and wrote there in Pergamum. There was a great library that was rivaled only by the great library of Alexandria. It is believed that there were 200,000 volumes in the library there in Pergamum. The temple of Zeus was there, and it was dedicated to Asclepius, the serpent god. In fact, in 1871, archaeologists discovered the altar of Zeus with the inscription, 
Zeus Soter, which means Zeus, Savior. The serpent god also bore the name of the great physician. In the temple a living serpent was kept and worshipped. Many of the ancient coins that have been dug up at Pergamum depict a serpent wrapped around a pole similar to the one that symbolizes medical practice today. The capital of the gods was there in Pergamum, and the first temple of the imperial cult was built there in honor of Rome and Augustus. The worship of the divine emperor was touchstone of civil society under the emperor Domitian at the end of the first century. This caused a very grave crisis for those who were faithful to Jesus Christ because they refused to worship the emperor and to burn incense in his honor. Sun worship and an apostate remnant of Babylonian priests had its seat there. It's no coincidence that in the book of Revelation Satan is called the ancient serpent and the city of Pergamum was dedicated to the worship of the serpent. As we shall see, Pergamum was the link between ancient Babylon, pagan Rome, and finally papal Rome. Now let's take a look at the description that is given of Christ in the message to Pergamum. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 12 gives us the picture of Christ as this message begins. It says there in verse 12, And to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. Don't forget that because we're going to come back to it a little bit later on. This symbol of the sword is used at the beginning of the book as we studied on Sabbath. There the sword is remedial. The purpose of the sword is to seek out the sin of the church and then the sword cut it out. In other words, when the message is given to the churches, the churches can still apply the remedy of the sword. But the sword, as we notice, also appears at the end of the book in Revelation 19 verse 15. And there the sword is not to detect sin and to cut out the sin, the sword is to strike the nations because probation has closed. Notice Hebrews chapter 4 and verses 12 and 13 where uh, we find both symbols, the eyes of fire that penetrate and see and the sword that is meant to cut out the sin as the eyes detect the sin. Hebrews chapter 4 verses 12 and 13, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. See there's, we have what the symbol represents. It represents the word of God and it's sharp. He continues saying, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a, here comes the sight part, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight. See there are the eyes, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So the introductory verse to the church of Pergamum presents the eyes of Jesus as a sword that detects sin and wants to cut out the sin. Now another characteristic, by the way, I want you to remember this sword symbol because it's used at the end of the message as well. So don't forget the, the two-edged sword. Now also we are told that Satan's throne was there in Pergamum or in Pergamos. Revelation chapter 2, 13, the first part of the verse says, I know your works and where you dwell. You dwell where Satan's throne is. Now it's no coincidence that Jesus, when he was tempted the third time by the devil, the devil took him to a very high mountain, and he showed him all of the kingdoms of the world. And he said, all of these kingdoms I will give you if you simply bow down and worship me. Jesus had come to set up his spiritual kingdom, the church. He had not come to take over the political kingdoms of the world. And Satan, taking him to this high mountain, offered him all of the kingdoms of the world. But Jesus instantly refused. Amen. It's no coincidence 
that in the church of Pergamum, which represents the period of Constantine, Satan offered the bishop of Rome those same kingdoms, but he did not reject the kingdoms of this world. He accepted the rulership over them. Now let's talk about the transference of Satan's throne through Pergamum from, papal, from pagan to papal Rome. I'm going to give you a little bit of history, bear with me, uh, there's a lot of details here that I'm going to cover in a very, very short period of time. Nebuchadnezzar's goal when he established the Neo-Babylonian Empire was to re-establish Babylon as it was at the Tower of Babel. To extend his religion he had a pagan polytheistic group of Magi and astrologers that perpetuated the religion of Babylon. They're mentioned for example in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 2. Now when Babylon fell because Cyrus came and conquered the city, things changed drastically. You see Cyrus was a Zoroastrian and Zoroastrianism was a religion of monotheistic emphasis. In other words they believed only in one God. Cyrus was tolerant of all religions and amazingly gave religious liberty to all uh, nations that had been captive in Babylon. Now when Cyrus captured the city of Babylon because he was a Zoroastrian, the pagan priests that had led the religion of Babylon fled, and they fled to the city of Pergamum in Asia Minor. There they established Babylonian worship. By the way if you want a, a full documentation of this, uh, I wrote a long uh, section on Daniel 8 where I deal with a full historical uh, reference to what I'm talking about now. Also uh, the works of Humphrey Prideaux who wrote about the Medo-Persian Empire, uh, you could uh, also read that there, but I have to go quickly because we're limited in time. So uh, in the year 520, by the way Cyrus conquered Babylon in 539, in the year 520 Darius the first, he's not the same as Darius the Mede who conquered Babylon with Cyrus, but in 520 Darius the first massacred a large number of these polytheistic Babylonian priests that had remained in the kingdom of Medo-Persia. And we know from history that those who survived fled to Pergamum in Asia Minor to continue the religion there. The religion of the pagan polytheistic Babylonians was not compatible with the Zoroastrianism of Cyrus. Then in the year 482 King Artaxerxes further massacred Babylonian priests that had still remained, and he destroyed their gods, and he melted the image of the sun god Marduk. Once again the Babylonian priests with their polytheistic practices fled to the city of Pergamum. Interesting, interesting that they always moved to Pergamum with the religion of ancient Babylon. In the year 67 BC Pompey made Mithraism the main religion of the Roman Empire, and it became also the main religion of the Roman legions. They adopted the eagle as a symbol of the sun god Mithra, and as the ensign of the Roman legions. Franz Cumont has documented abundant historical evidence that Rome acquired its religion and culture from Pergamum, and Pergamum from Babylon through the apostate Babylonian priesthood. Perhaps this is the reason why in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 13 Rome is referred to as Babylon, interestingly enough, because from Babylon the religion was transferred to Pergamum and then through uh, Pompeii it was transferred to the Roman Empire. But the story doesn't end there. Pagan Rome then transferred this apostate religion from pagan Rome to papal Rome through Pergamum, the Pergamum that we're studying about this evening. You see Constantine the Great was a pagan Roman emperor, and he believed in the religion that had been established in Pergamum, and he offered the kingdom to 
the church. And the church accepted the kingdom with all of the pagan practices that characterized the Babylonian priests. And so you have this clear chain where from ancient Babylon the religion is transferred to Pergamum, literal Pergamum in Asia, Asia Minor, and then from Pergamum through Pompeii to Rome, and then from pagan Rome through Pergamum, the, the third church of Revelation, eventually to papal Rome. So there's something about Pergamum. That is where Satan's throne is. Now Christians during this period of the church of Pergamum, in other words, lived at the very headquarters of Satan, the man of sin, the mystery of iniquity. I want to read you a statement, several statements actually now, from historians about what happened in Rome. But before I do that, I want to read Revelation 13 verses 1 and 2. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast that I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And now notice this, this beast represents, by the way, the papacy. It's the beast that rises from the sea. And notice now uh, what, what we find. It says at the end of verse 2, the dragon, symbol of Rome, the one who tried to kill the child when the child was born, the dragon gave him, that is the beast from the sea, his what? His power, what else? His throne and great authority. What was in Pergamum? Satan's what? Satan's throne. So Satan's throne was transferred from pagan Rome to what? To papal Rome, according to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 13. Now I'm going to read you a few statements from historians about how this occurred. First, from Great Controversy, pages 49 and 50. Little by little, at first in stealth and silence, and then more openly as it increased in strength and gained control of the minds of men, the mystery of iniquity carried forward its deceptive and blasphemous work. Almost imperceptibly, the customs of heathenism found their way into the Christian church. Where did those customs of heathenism come from? From Babylon to ancient Pergamum to pagan Rome and then to where? To papal Rome. Once again, almost imperceptibly, the customs of heathenism found their way into the Christian church. The spirit of compromise and conformity was restrained for a time by the fierce persecutions, that's the church of Smyrna by the way, by the, first, by the fierce persecutions which the church endured under paganism. But as persecution ceased, this would be the year 313, the Edict of Milan by Constantine, and Christianity entered the courts and palaces of kings. She laid aside the humble simplicity of Christ and his apostles for the pomp and pride of pagan priests and rulers. And in place of the requirements of God, she substituted human theories and traditions. The nominal conversion of Constantine, notice this is the church of Pergamum, before the papacy rises to power in the year 538. The nominal conversion of Constantine in the early part of the fourth century caused great rejoicing. Huh. And the world, cloaked with a form of righteousness, walked into the church. Now the work of corruption rap rapidly progressed. Paganism, while appearing to be vanquished, became the conqueror. Her spirit controlled the church. Her doctrines, ceremonies, and superstitions were incorporated into the faith and worship of the professed followers of Christ. And where did all of those doctrines, ceremonies, and superstitions come from? From ancient Babylon. It's no coincidence that in Revelation chapter 17 the harlot is called Babylon. Because there's an unbroken link from Babylon to Pergamum to Rome, pagan Rome to papal Rome. And I'm not going to include what happens with Protestantism as well. That's another subject for another time. Let me read from the book Global Peace by Dave Hunt, pages 106 and 107. He's speaking about Constantine, a brilliant military commander. Constantine also understood 
that there could be no political stability without religious unity. Yet to accomplish that feat would require a union between paganism and Christianity. How could it be accomplished? The empire needed an ecumenical religion that would appeal to every citizen in a multi multicultural society. Giving Christianity official status was not enough to bring internal peace to the empire. Christianity had to undergo a transformation so that pagans could convert without giving up their old beliefs and rituals. Constantine himself exemplified this expediency. This is the period of Pergamum, when the world enters the church, and the church becomes linked with the state. Let me read you what Henry Cardinal Newman wrote. You have the reference on the screen. He wrote this, We are told in various ways by Eusebius that Constantine, in order to recommend the new religion to the heathen, where did those heathen with their beliefs come from? Babylon, very well, to recommend the new religion to the heathen, transferred into it the outward ornaments to which they had been accustomed in their own. It was not necessary to go into a subject which the diligence of Protestant writers has made familiar to most of us. The use of temples, and these dedicated to particular saints, and ornamented on occasions uh, with branches of trees, incense, lamps and candles, votive offerings on recovery from illness, holy water, asylums, holy days and seasons, use of calendars, processions, blessings on the fields, sacerdotal vestments, the tonsure, the ring in marriage, turning east, images at a latter date, perhaps the ecclesiastical chant, and the Kyrie Eliason are all of pagan origin and sanctified by their adoption into the church. That is written not by a Protestant, but by Henry Cardinal Newman, who was converted to Roman Catholicism from the English church, Anglican Church, or the Church of England. Let me read you what Phyllis Schaff wrote. He was a great historian, one of the most renowned historians, church historians. He wrote this in his book, History of the Christian Church. But the elevation of Christianity, notice the word elevation. What does Pergamum mean? It means height or elevation. The elevation of Christianity as the religion of the state presents also an opposite aspect to our contemplation. It involved great risk of degeneracy to the church. The Roman state with its laws, institutions, and usages was still deeply rooted in heathenism and could not be transformed by a magical stroke. The Christianizing of the state amounted therefore in great measure to a paganizing and secularizing of the church. The world overcame the church as much as the church overcame the world, and the temporal gain of Christianity was in many respects canceled by spiritual loss. The mass of the Roman Empire was baptized only with water, not with the spirit of the gospel, and it smuggled heathen manners and practices into the sanctuary under a new name. The very combination of the cross with the military ensign by Constantine was the most doubtful omen, portending an unhappy mixture of the temporal and of the spiritual. Are you catching a picture of the period of Pergamum? It's the time when the church now compromises. It wants to be politically correct, not to be persecuted anymore. It adopts the customs of the world, actually the pagan practices that came from Babylon to literal Pergamon in Asia Minor, then to the Roman Empire, and through the Roman Empire into the papacy. And by the way, some of those beliefs infiltrated Protestantism and are still held by Protestantism today. Like the Sunday as a day of worship, like an eternally burning hell, like the idea that people when they die they're not dead, the immortality of the soul, all of those things crept into Protestantism from the mother Roman Catholicism. Now let's notice Revelation chapter 2 and verse 13, there were some faithful people in the church of Pergamum, one of them was called Antipas. Let's read Revelation 2 verse 13, and you hold fast to my name, and did not deny my faith, 
even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Do you notice once again the throne of Satan is there and Satan dwells there. Why? Because his throne was trans transferred to Babylon, to Pergamum, to literal Pergamum, then it was transferred to the Roman Empire, then to spiritual Pergamum, and then eventually through spiritual Pergamum, the third church, into the papacy. Satan's throne is transferred to all of those places. Now who was this Antipas, one of the few faithful ones in the church of Pergamum? Well there's a patristic tradition that Antipas was martyred during the persecutions of Domitian at the end of the first century. They say that he was shut up in a brazen bull which was then heated until it was red hot and of course he was baked to death, so to speak, and yet he was faithful to God. Amen. And he will be one of those from the church of Pergamum who will be commended when he resurrects from the dead, when Jesus says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 14. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 14. Now a certain personage is going to be mentioned here. His name is Balaam. You see the story of Balaam is going to illustrate in living color this phenomenon of what happened to the church during the period of Pergamum. Amen. Let's read Revelation 2 and verse 14. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, and now notice two things to eat things sacrificed to idols, to practice idolatry in other words, and to commit sexual immorality, actually the King James Version says to commit fornication. It's the same word that is used for the harlot in Revelation chapter 13. So idolatry and fornication are the two things that were brought into Israel by Balaam. So if Balaam is mentioned, we need to study about Balaam, you think? Yes. So let's take a look at Balaam. Now Satan throughout the course of history has used two methods to try and destroy God's people. One method is persecution and the other method is corrupting them through infiltration. We see this from the very beginning. You know you have the story of Cain and Abel. Abel was a righteous person, Cain was of the wicked one according to 1 John 3 12. So Satan used Cain to kill his brother Abel, said problem solved. But Satan soon, soon found out that he couldn't kill all of God's followers, so he said, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my strategy. He went to a plan B, and before the flood, instead of killing all of the faithful, what he did was he led the sons of God, the righteous, to enter into marriages with the daughters of men and corrupted humanity from within. That's been the devil's method all the time, if he can't kill you, he will corrupt you. Now what happened in the church of Pergamum? I'm going to read a quotation from Christ Triumphant, page 319. This was Satan's plan A. This is the church of Smyrna that we studied about in our last lecture. Notice Christ Triumphant 319. In vain were Satan's efforts to destroy the church of Christ by violence. The great controversy in which the disciples of Jesus yielded up their lives did not cease when these faithful standard bearers fell at their post. By defeat they conquered. God's workmen were slain, but His work went steadily forward. The gospel continued to spread, and the number of its adherents to increase, said a Christian expostulating with the heathen rulers who were urging forward the persecution. You may torment, afflict, and vex us, your wickedness puts our weakness to the test, but your cruelty is of no avail. It is but a stronger invitation to bring others to our persuasion. The more we are mowed down, the more we spring up again. The blood of Christians is seed. So the devil says, now, now persecution isn't working too well. <laughs> what happened in the church of Smyrna? Because the more I persecute, the more the blood of Christians is seen, and the more Christianity grows. So I have to change my strategy, so now Satan goes to a plan B. He says, if I can't fight them, 
join them. In other words, corrupt them from within. Now, let me read you a statement that we find in Great Controversy, page 42 and 43, about what happened after the persecutions of Smyrna. The great adversary now endeavored to gain by artifice what he had failed to secure by force. Are you seeing what's happening here? Yes. So in the church of Smyrna, couldn't destroy the church through persecution. So he says, now I'm going to use a different method. Persecution ceased. And in its stead were substituted dangerous allurements of temporal prosperity and worldly honor. Idolaters, notice, idolaters were led to receive a part of the Christian faith while they rejected other essential truths. They professed to accept Jesus as the Son of God and to believe in His death and resurrection, but they had no conviction of sin and felt no need of repentance or a change of heart. With some concessions on their part, they professed that Christians should make concessions, that all might unite on the platform of belief in Christ. Now the church was in fearful peril. Prison, torture, fire and sword were blessings in comparison with this. Some of the Christians stood firm, declaring that they could make no compromise. Others were in favor of yielding or modifying some features of their faith and uniting with those who had accepted a part of Christianity. Of course, that's not happening in the world today, right? <laughs> Urging that this might be the means of their full conversion. In other words, the church is going to grow by including everybody. That was a time of deep, deep anguish to the faithful followers of Christ. Under a cloak of pretended Christianity, Satan was insinuating himself into the church to corrupt their faith and turn their minds from the word of truth. So you say, what does this have to do with Balaam? Well, let's read Revelation 2.14 again. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols, so you have idolatry, and by committing sexual immorality or fornication. So if Balaam is mentioned in connection with Pergamum, it would be a good idea to study the story of Balaam, you think? Let's go to Numbers 22 and verse 3. There was a pagan king whose name was Balak, and he was very afraid of Israel. He was afraid that Israel was going to destroy him and his nation. Notice Numbers 22 and verse 3. And Moab was exceedingly afraid of the people, because they were many. See, there were many Israelites. And Moab was sick with dread because of the children of Israel. Now compare this with Great Controversy, page 39, speaking about the church of Pergamum. Paganism foresaw that should the gospel triumph, her temples and altars would be swept away. Therefore she summoned her forces to destroy Christianity. Very similar. You see, Moab was afraid that their nation and religion would be taken away by the growing number of Israelites. And in the same way, we find this happening with the church. And so, what Balak does is he tries to get Balaam to curse Israel from outside. Let's notice the four attempts of Balaam to curse Israel from outside. Numbers 22 and verse 18. Notice what Balaam said to Balak. Even if Balak, Balak gave me his palace filled with silver and gold, I could not do anything great or small to go beyond the command of the Lord my God. I cannot curse Israel from outside. So now there's a second attempt. Balaam, Balak tells Balaam, you know, I'll, I'll, make, uh, I'll make it good for you if you go and curse Israel. Numbers 23, verses 8 through 10. Notice what Balaam says. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? And how shall I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? For from the top of the rocks I see him. See, in, when, when the first, when Balaam tried to, uh, or was tried to entice uh, to, to curse Israel the first time, he was in a place where he couldn't see the people. So Balak said, maybe if you go to a place where you, where you can see the people, you'll be able to curse them more easily. Well, that was a big mistake, because it says, how shall I curse whom God has not cursed? 
and how shall I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? For from the top of the rocks I see him, that is Israel, and from the hills I behold him there, a people dwelling alone, not reckoning in itself among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob or the number one-fourth of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous and let my end be like this. <laughs> so now Balak tries a third time. Notice Numbers 23, verses 20 to 23. Behold, I have received a command to bless. He has blessed, says Balaam, and I cannot reverse it. He has, now notice the reason why. He has not observed iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. Interesting. Would that describe the church of Smyrna, the persecuted church? Absolutely. The Lord of God is with him. And the shout of a king is among them. God brings them out of Egypt. He has strength like a wild ox. For there is no sorcery against Jacob, nor is there any divination against Israel. It now must be said of Jacob and of Israel, Oh, what God has done. <laughs> so Balak is becoming increasingly frustrated. So he tries a fourth time. It's found in Numbers 24, verse 5 and verse 9. <laughs> Notice what Balaam ends up saying. How beautiful are your tents, O Jacob. Your dwelling places, O Israel. May those who bless you be blessed, and those who curse you be cursed. Could Balaam curse Israel from outside? No, no because Israel was in a proper and good relationship with the Lord. So now Balaam comes up with a diabolical scheme. He says, I know how I can curse Israel so that Israel falls and you don't have to fear Israel anymore. What we need to do is have some of your Moabite women infiltrate Israel and lead them to practice idolatry and to commit fornication. And then if this happens within Israel, God will no longer favor Israel. He will take away his protection from the people. Notice Numbers 25 and verses 1 to 3. Are you understanding how Balaam is related to the church of Pergamum? Yes. For church of Thy the church of Smyrna, persecution. The church is pure because of persecution. And the church grows. Satan says, plan B. This persecution thing doesn't work. And so now Satan infiltrates the church and brings idolatry, and fornication into the church. Numbers 25, 1 to 3. Then Israel remained in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit what? Harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods. There's the idolatry. And the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor. By the way, that's the sun god. And the angel of the Lord was aroused against Israel. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 451, Ellen White wrote, speaking about what Balaam did, he immediately returned to the land of Moab and laid his plans before the king. The Moabites themselves were convinced that so long as Israel remained true to God, he would be their shield. The plan proposed by Balaam was to separate them from God by enticing them into idolatry. If they could be led to engage in the licentious worship of Baal and Ashtaroth, that's the sun god and the moon god, by the way, their omnipotent protector would become their enemy, and they would soon fall a prey to the fierce warlike nations around them. This plan was readily accepted by the king, and Balaam himself remained to assist in carrying it into effect. Balaam witnessed the success of his diabolical scheme. Now, do you remember that in the church of Pergamum you have reference to the sword? You know, what did Balaam say? I cannot go beyond the command of the Lord. I can't go beyond the word of the Lord, is what he says. But when he goes against the command of the Lord, I want you to notice how Balaam dies. Numbers 31 and verses 7 and 8. Numbers 31 verses 7 and 8. And they warred against the Midianites, just as the Lord commanded Moses. And they killed all the males. This is Israel. They killed the kings of Midian with the rest of those who were killed. Evi, Rechem, Zur, Ur, and Reba, the five kings of Midian. And now notice this. 
Balaam the son of Beor, they also killed with the sword. Are you understanding this? Why the sword is mentioned in the connection with the church of Pergamum? By the way, Balaam was once a true prophet. He had a good relationship with the Lord. But he sold himself for money. Let me read you this statement from Great Controversy, page 42. Incidentally, uh, this is interesting. You know, the papacy introduced idolatry, introduced spiritual fornication into the church. Was the papacy also wounded by the sword? In Revelation chapter 13, it says, He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. So what happened to Balaam, the church was in a good relationship, and then through the papacy it becomes corrupt, happened literally with Balaam in the Old Testament. Great Controversy, page 42. Satan therefore laid his plans to war more successfully against the government of God by planting his banner in the Christian church. If the followers of Christ could be deceived and led to displease God, are you seeing the picture of Balaam now? Then their strength, fortitude, and firmness would fail, and they would fall an easy prey. So you have the church of Ephesus, the desirable church. It had begun to lose its first love. So God allows persecution because persecution purifies the church. So when persecution comes into the church, then the church grows phenomenally. Satan wants to get rid of the church by persecution. So Satan says, this is, this is actually going against what I want. So he says, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to change my strategy. Instead of persecuting the church, I'm going to try and infiltrate the church. And so he introduces idolatry and spiritual fornication into the church. And the church loses the favor of God. Did you notice also that in the church of Pergamum, we're told this in Revelation 2 verse 15, Thus you have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Do you remember that the church of Ephesus hated the Nicolaitans? But now it says that they're tolerating the Nicolaitans. Let me refresh your memory about who the Nicolaitans were. This is found in Bible Echo, a um, journal written by Ellen White, February 8, 1897. She's speaking about those who hold the same doctrine today. Those who are teaching this doctrine today have much to say in regard to faith and the righteousness of Christ, but they pervert the truth and make it serve the cause of error. Notice they pervert the truth. They declare that we only have to believe on Jesus Christ and that faith is sufficient. That the righteousness of Christ is to be the sinner's credentials, that this imputed righteousness fulfills the law for us, and that we are under no obligation to obey the law of God. This class claims that Christ came to save sinners, and that He has saved them. I am saved, they will repeat over and over again. However, are they saved while transgressing the law of Jehovah? No, for the garments of Christ's righteousness are not a cloak for iniquity. Such teaching is a gross deception, and Christ becomes to these persons a stumbling block as He did to the Jews. Notice this is a reference to the church of Pergamum. To the Jews, because they would not receive Him as their personal Savior, to these professed believers in Christ, because they separate Christ and the law and regard faith as a substitute for obedience. They separate the Father and the Son, the Savior of the world. Virtually they teach, both by precept and example, that Christ, by His death, saves men in their transgressions. And you know, we read a statement in our previous lecture about uh, the fact that the Jewish nation and Christians at the end of time are committing basically the same sin. What was the sin of the Jews? They rejected Jesus. What will be the sin of the Christian world at the end of time? They will reject the law. Is that the same thing? Yes, because the law is a reflection of the character of Christ. So how can you say that you love Jesus and you hate the law when the law is a reflection of the character of Christ? It's the same sin, but looked at from a different perspective. Now what message can the church derive today from the message to the church of Pergamum? 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. We're going to read a series of Bible verses now about what we should learn. Should we be vigilant about uh, traditions and practices, pagan practices, worldly practices, infiltrating the church? Yes. Absolutely. 2 Timothy 3 verse 12 says, Indeed, and all, how many? 
all who desire to do what? To live godly, not to believe only, but to live godly in Christ Jesus might suffer persecution. No, thank you very much, thank you. Okay, will suffer persecution. So the question is, why isn't the church suffering persecution today? We'll come to that a little bit later. Notice John 17 verse 14, John 17 verse 14. Jesus is speaking, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So why did the world hate the disciples of Jesus? Because they were not of the world. Why was Jesus hated? Because he was not of the world. He was in the world, but he was not of the world. Notice James chapter 4 and verse 4. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Is there a lot of worldliness in the church today? Yes. Not only in the, in the churches out there, but in the Adventist church. Yes. Absolutely. It's, re, it's reflected in our dress, in what we watch, in what we listen to, the music we listen to, and the programs that we watch, etc. Worldly has really crept into the church. And we need to learn a, a, what happened with the church of Pergamum and what happened with Israel in the Old Testament so that we do not allow the church to go down the same road. Listen to this statement, Great Controversy, page 48. There is another and more important question that should engage the attention of the churches today. The Apostle Paul declares that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And now comes the question, why is it then that persecution seems in a great degree to slumber? How many reasons are there? That persecution slumbers? How many reasons? The only reason is that the church has conformed to the world standard and therefore awakens no opposition. The religion which is current in our day is not of the pure and holy character that marked the Christian faith in the days of Christ and His apostles. It is only because of the spirit of... what? Oh, is that, is that Pergamum? Yes, of compromise with sin. Because the great truths of the Word of God are so indifferently regarded, because there is so little vital godliness in the church, that Christianity is apparently so popular with the world, just like in Pergamum. And then she gives a, a secret of how the church will be persecuted again. She says, let there be a revival of the faith and power of the early church, Amen. and the spirit of persecution will be revived and the fires of persecution will be rekindled. So why is the church not persecuted today? Because the church has accommodated to the customs and beliefs and practices of the world. The message of Pergamum is not only for the people who lived during that period, it has lessons for us just as do all of the other messages to the churches. Now, what warning does God give to the church of Pergamum? Revelation 2 verse 16. He says, repent. Should Balaam have repented? Yes. Would he been have been killed with the sword if he had used the sword the way God said he was supposed to? If he had obeyed the word? No. It says, repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with what? With the sword of my mouth. So we can e either accept the sword remedially, in other words, the sword to detect our sin and to cut it out and obey what God says, or else we can set the word of God aside and allow worldliness to come into our lives and worldliness to come into the church, and the sword that should have healed us will be the sword that will destroy us. Now, God gave beautiful promises to the church of Pergamum. Revelation 2, verse 17. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. Now, when the Bible talks about hidden manna, uh, you can understand it in two ways. You can understand it spiritually, and you can understand it literally. Now, what does the manna represent spiritually? I think you're aware of this. The manna represents Jesus. 
and the Word of God, of course, but it represents Jesus, right? You remember John chapter 6, Jesus said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. He who eats this bread will, not, will live forever. You remember it says that in John chapter 6? Now how do we assimilate Jesus, spiritually speaking? Now we're not eating literally his flesh. How do we assimilate Jesus? Through his word. See, man does not live by bread alone, it's spoken of in the context of the manna, but by every what? Word. By every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We feed on the manna through a study of God's word. Amen. But there's another application of the manna. You see, the manna of God is hidden. It is hidden in the Ark of the Covenant, in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And you know what God is going to do someday to the overcomers? The promise that God makes to the church of Pergamum? He's going to bring out the manna, and he's going to set it on the table for God's people to eat, literally. Because they assimilated Jesus Christ spiritually, because they became spiritually in tune with Jesus, they will sit at the table and eat literal manna. Notice Testimonies for the Church, volume 1, pages 69 and 70. Well, Ellen White is here describing something she saw in vision. She says, Here I saw a table of pure silver. It was many miles in length. Yet our eyes could extend over it. See, our eyes are going to be fixed. I saw the fruit of the tree of life. The manna, almonds, figs, pomegranates, grapes, and many other kinds of fruit. So maybe mangoes were there. <laughs> she continues, I asked Jesus to let me eat of the fruit. And he said, not now. Those who eat of the fruit of this land go back to earth no more. But in a little while, if faithful, remember that uh, to the churches Jesus says, to him who is faithful, if faithful, you shall both eat of the fruit of the tree of life and drink of the water of the fountain. And said he, you must go back to the earth again and relate to others what I have revealed to you. Then an angel bore me gently down to this dark world. Sometimes I think I can stay here no longer. All things of earth look so dreary. I feel very lonely here, for I have seen a better land. Oh, that I had wings like a dove. Then would I fly away and be at rest. What a beautiful statement. She longed for heaven because she had seen the better land. And when we assimilate the spiritual manna, we also long for the better land. Now there's another promise that we find here, and that is the promise of the white stone. It says in Revelation 2 verse 17, And I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Now what does the name represent in Scripture? It represents the character. This idea of a new name actually comes from the story of Jacob. You remember the story of Jacob when he struggled with the angel? He struggled all night. And in the morning he cried out, uh, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And the angel, who by the way is Jesus Christ, that's the angel of the Lord, he says, let me go for it's dawning. And Jacob grabs onto him and says, I will not let you go until you bless me. And then Jesus, the angel of the Lord, says to Jacob, what's your name? And Jacob says, well, my name is Supplanter. <laughs> because that's what Jacob means. It means somebody who tries to take somebody else's place, a supplanter. And by the way, uh, Jacob was that way from the moment of his birth. Because the Bible says that he was latched onto his uh, brother's ankle trying to be born first. <laughs> so he tried to take his place from the time of his birth. And that's why, why Esau said, you named him well after he stole the birthright. You know, supplanter. And so his character was a devious character. But when he struggles with the angel, when he struggles with Jesus in prayer and overcomes both man and God, it says there, then the angel of the Lord Jesus Christ says to him, your name will no longer be called supplanter. Your name will be called Israel, Prince of God. Why did God change Jacob's name? Because Jacob's character had changed. He was no longer a supplanter. He was no longer devious. He was now obedient to the Lord. Amen. He was faithful to God. Notice Isaiah chapter 62 and verse 2. A glorious promise 
that God makes to those who will overcome. The Gentiles shall see your righteousness, and all kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name, that the mouth of the Lord will name. So only God knows what name He's going to give us, and only we will know what the name is, because it is a reflection of our character. Of course, Revelation picks up on this idea of a new name uh, at the end of time. In Revelation chapter 14 and verse 1, we find a description of the 144,000. They're standing victorious on Mount Zion. They've overcome the beast, his image, his mark, and the number of his name. They have been faithful, even facing death, even though they were not slain. And they stand victorious, and the description is given in Revelation chapter 14, verse 1. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, these are the end time saints that will not die, by the way, they're not technically Pergamites, if you please, but they will have a similar characteristic. It says, and with him 144,000, having his Father's name written on their foreheads. Amen. What is the Father's name? The name is the what? The character. When Moses was on the mount and he said, show me your glory, God showed him his character. And when Moses came down from the mountain, his face was shining with the glory of God because the glory of God's character rubs off Amen. when you spend time with him. Amen. So now we've studied the third church. Things are not going to get better before they get a lot worse. The fourth church is the church of Thyatira. That is the apostate church. You see, when the world enters the church and the church mingles with the state, pagan practices come into the church, fornication with the state comes in, now the church enters a stage of apostasy known as the Dark Ages. It is the period of papal supremacy. You see, the church accepted the offer of Constantine, and when it did, the world entered the church, and the result was an apostasy from all of the truths that we find in God's Word, and embracing the traditions of men and the pagan practices of the nations that began at the Tower of Babel, where Babylon originated. That will be our next study.